Hi, and welcome to Talking Sunday Readings. My name is Ann Carter. I am here again with Pastor Richard Stadler and with Tim Carter. And we are talking again about the readings that have been chosen for the next Sunday in our liturgy, in our liturgical year. Um, we decided a few weeks ago that we would change things up a little bit. If you have been with us for a while, you know that we usually spend quite a bit of equal time on the three or even four readings that have been chosen by different churches. We're changing that up just a little bit to be more inquisitive, to ask a few more questions from um, different eyes about what was going on and to offer maybe a little more background information, especially about some of the narratives because as we, as a congregational member, uh, walking into the church, sitting down and hearing, for instance, the lesson today we have from Jonah, which is taken from the middle of the book, how do you know what's going on? How do you know the background? How do you know where Jonah is? How do you know where anybody is? Um, the gospel lesson, how do you know where the Sea of Galilee is if you haven't been there, if you don't have a map in front of you? So we're gonna do, we're gonna approach the readings just a little differently so that we can glean just a little bit, bit, bit more information out of them. Today, we're discussing the readings for the third Sunday after Epiphany, and those readings are from the Old Testament, like I said, the book of Jonah, chapter three, verses one through five and verse 10. Then we jump to the epistle in the New Testament, which is 1 Corinthians, which is an interesting book because, man, that Corinthian congregation had some issues. Um, that's chapter 7, verses 29 to 31. And then we are in the Gospel of Mark in this year of the lectionary, um, and that's Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. And we find as we read these little stories, these little pericopes from Mark that, man, they're packed with information. He packs a whole bunch of stuff into one tiny little phrase, and we're going to try to break it apart just a little bit to make sure that we have a little greater understanding of it. We're going to try to do that in as short amount of time as possible. A reading from Jonah. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So to begin, Jonah, chapter 3, uh, God comes to Jonah and he says, I'm coming to you a second time and I'm telling you to go to Nineveh. Well, we might say, when did he come the first time? And what happened? And why is he coming to him the second time? Oh, yep. If you're, if you're at all familiar with Jonah, you know that God came to Jonah and told him to go and preach to the Ninevites and get them to repent. And Jonah said, no, he wasn't going to go. He went in the opposite direction. He got on a ship and there was a big storm and the crew threw Jonah into the water of the Mediterranean where Jonah was swallowed by a whale. This story, Jonah 3, um, is Jonah on the beach after the whale has spit him up and God gives him another chance to do what he what God asked him to do. Now, Dick, I know that you, speaking of maps, I know that you have some visual aids for us to see where exactly uh, he was and where he was supposed to go and okay. uh, what he was supposed to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, he tries to go to Tarshish, which is about 2,500 miles away from Joppa, where he is when God comes to him the first time. And then after all that experience that Ann summarized, he spit out here on the land and God comes to him the second time that we're reading about and he sends him 550 miles away to Nineveh. And so th this picture I think can help everybody just identify where all this action is taking place. The question I think everybody asks is why would he not want to do what a prophet is supposed to do and that is preach to people. Um, and I've heard different theories. Uh, maybe you two uh, have two. Um, one is that 
he was afraid of the Assyrians. And there would be good reason for that because they were notorious for just victimizing their foes when they won a battle. They would strip the skin off them alive. They would cut off their heads and make a pile of heads. I mean, it was gruesome. They, they would impale people alive on a stake. They, they were cruel and they had a reputation for that. So maybe that's it, but that isn't what he says. And we get the answer to why he didn't want to go in Jonah 4 verses 1 and 2. And there he says, after Nineveh repents, as we read about in this reading, he preaches, he goes into the middle of one day's journey in, in a city so large that it takes three days to cover it. And uh, they do a surprising thing. He preaches 40 days and you're going to be destroyed and they all repent. And these are the common people. And then the king hears about it. And he follows them and he also repents and he puts on sackcloth and, and ashes. And um, he then says, see, this is why I didn't want to go because I knew that you would relent and you would forgive them. Now you would think he'd rejoice about that, right? But in the Old Testament, it says it, you can determine who a true prophet is and we're going to hear about that in next week's uh, old testament lesson if what he says is going to happen doesn't happen he's a false prophet and uh, there's even a jewish legend that says that god sent him to jerusalem to rail against their sins and promise destruction and they repented and god let them uh survive and people after that according to the jewish legends identified him as a false prophet. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. That's just in Jewish legends. It's not in the scriptures. But that may have been the thing that he was afraid of, too, is that if he goes and God relents, then people are going to say, well, don't listen to what he has to say because it never happens, you know. And so um, that may have been something else. Have you heard any other uh, guesses as to why he would be opposed to going to Assyria? Well, I haven't heard of anything, but I've always assumed that he just wanted God to punish him. He didn't want God to forgive him. They were awful. And he, he wanted God to give them their just desserts because he, they were afraid that Assyria was going to come and take, over, take them over. Well, but, and there, yeah, there are a number of commentaries who do suggest that, that he was a bigot. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and he did not want the Assyrians to uh, have a chance to be forgiven. And so maybe, and that meant that the book was written just to overcome that and to remind people of the universal love of God, even for the people that we hate and love to hate. And so this book can be a challenging reminder to us believers. Uh, don't identify any group of people, no matter how evil and bad they've been, as beyond the love and the grace of God, because God loves the whole world. And that's why he sent his son. So mm -hmm. It's a, very, it, it's a very interesting story. Tim, you had a couple of questions, didn't you? Well, yeah, you covered most of them. Um, I was just mostly curious about where they were and, and the, the geography of it all and where Jonah was, where he was running away to. Um, a couple of more specific ones. Um, the, the, the one that stands out to me is the, they, they say that they um, uh, repented with ashes and they all wore sackcloth. And I've always wondered kind of what is sackcloth. Um, I just picture a burlap sack, but I, I'm wondering if, uh, what exactly that is and, um, and kind of uh, to get a fuller picture, you know, what, 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 was, what was going on there with the ashes and the sackcloth? The, the lexicons that I checked uh, kind of uh, liken it to burlap. Okay. Um, but what is interesting is we know that people wore sackcloth in Israel. Apparently, the other cultures also repented by wearing sackcloth. So this may have been more universal than what I used to assume, and that only Israelites and believers in God would, would do this. And so um, it, and they put the sackcloth on the animals as well. Uh, and so oh, yeah. they, they are covering uh, their, their fear of this God of Israel is so great that they want to protect their animals and their livelihood that those animals produce as well as themselves. And then the king orders everybody to do it yeah. Yeah. yeah i i read that it was a sign of submission a sign of sorrow and, and grief over what they had done that it was a visible outward sign of what they were feeling internally mm. 
and that it was almost um, like uh, the horsehair things that that um, monks used to wear that would scratch you. You know, they put it underneath their robes and um, and so that they were constantly reminded of of their of their sin mm -hmm. and but, that they but, were trying to be better. There is a history of. Jonah in the Bible elsewhere in Second Kings it says that he was a prophet under Jeroboam the um, second, and so we have an anchor point for him in the Bible, and so that's in about the seven hundreds, um, and uh, uh, early seven hundred seven hundred eighty seven so forth. In mm -hmm. seven twenty two, the Assyrians will sweep into Israel and haul off the ten northern tribes, and so the question is how long does their repentance last you know because if this happened during jonah's reign and jonah's reign was about 50 60 70 years before um the sacking of uh, the northern kingdom uh apparently didn't last that long because they came back after the israelis so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and and in light of that jonah was was he had a very um valid um he was afraid for the future of the nation. It was it was a valid concern. And well, and some suggest that the reason he didn't want them to repent is that would make Israel look bad for all the times they did not repent when they had a chance to. Oh, mm -hmm. And so he didn't want them to uh, be unfavorably compared to Israel and make Israel look bad. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another possibility when we we're trying to get inside his mind. But what is fascinating to me about Jonah, he's the only successful prophet in the Old Testament who gets people to do what God wants them to do. And he gets angry about it and he's not happy. And you say, holy cow, if Jeremiah had had the people of Israel uh, respond to his preaching that way or Isaiah or any of the others, uh, they would have rejoiced. But there's not any rejoicing there's no repentance in jonah so he's kind of a negative example an anti-hero for us mm -hmm. um, that we can learn from yeah interesting mm -hmm. um i'm gonna jump us right into um mark because there are a few of uh, interesting things and i don't want us to get too long i, I think that we can bring first corinthians into this a reading from first corinthians this is what i mean brothers the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. As I said um, in my little intro, there are packed phrases in the book of Mark. And Mark is really in a hurry. And things happen immediately in Mark and things are, are pressured in Mark and, and Jesus quickly goes here and, the, and things happen. Um, it's like he's trying to stuff this huge story into this small space of time and, and he wants you to understand things are, are really important during these three years of Jesus' life. It starts out, now after john was arrested well what do you mean john was arrested who arrested him what happened well we're going to get that story in mark 6 but for right now it's just a little hint of when you are a prophet of god things aren't always going to go well um john's going to get arrested and jesus then came to galilee and proclaimed the good news of god now 
well, what was that? What's the good news of God? And the, the, the good news is that the time is fulfilled. God is here. He is going to fulfill his purposes that he has promised for centuries. And he, Jesus picks the people that are going to help him accomplish this mission. And he, he chooses Simon and Andrew. He chooses James and John, the son of Zebedee. Now, I always have been very curious um, as to where all these guys were, where they were working. How was it that Jesus found them and knew them? So I have a couple of maps that I wanted to share to show um, where indeed here is Judea, the province in the first century. Um, I hope that you can see my arrow. This is the Sea of Galilee. This is the Jordan River down into the Dead Sea. And Jesus lived in Nazareth. Now he is around the Sea of Galilee. Here is Bethsaida. This is the place where we meet some of these guys. Um, the next, here's a different map. Um, here's Bethsaida. Here's Capernaum. Here again is Nazareth, where Jesus was from. Um, I would encourage anybody who has not been to Israel, if you can go, you should go. I had to, We had such a wonderful trip with Dick a couple of years ago to see all these things with your very eyes and to see how close everything is together. Now I'm going to get out of here. I hope that helps a little bit. Um, but my understanding when, when I was first taught this story was Jesus walked along and said, hey, guys, follow me. And they just dropped everything. They didn't know him. They didn't know anything about it. I've got a different idea of that now. I think that Jesus, who was 30 years old at the time, had been up there for a while and that he had talked to these guys and he had shared meals with these guys. And that after John was arrested, Jesus knew that now was the time to start his ministry. Um, because I don't think that God asks any of us just to drop everything. Um, that's just that's just me. Um, but he, he seems always to give us some prep, uh, to give us some opportunity to grow even accustomed to the idea, to fight with them about the idea, but to enter wholeheartedly into the work of God. Um, as he did with Jonah, he let him, I mean, they had a wrestling period of, of Jonah doing the work that God wanted him to do. Um, and that's, those are just my thoughts. I turn it over to you guys. Well, do you have thoughts, questions, comments? We, we know from our previous discussion last week or the week before, um, week before that this is not the first time he meets Peter and Andrew. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, after, uh, around the time of his baptism, uh, they are followers of John the Baptist and John the Baptist sends them to Jesus and Andrew then brings Peter to meet Jesus and Jesus changes his name from Simon to Cephas. And so um, uh, that would fit what you're talking about is that he had a familiarity with these people. And so he doesn't just walk up to them in this text and the first time gets them magically to, to follow him. Uh, the, mm -hmm. And the wonderful uh, series that is um, being shown around the world now in the life of Jesus. Um, it pictures that kind of familiarity before actually calling them into full-time service. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a good possibility. Can you go back to your map um, and share your map again? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the first one that you showed, because there's an interesting detail in that, that I think is worth um, being aware of as we listen to this text about John being arrested. Now back it up one, that, there it is. This one. You, mm -hmm. you look on here next to the Dead Sea, there's mm -hmm. Machaerus. Yep. See, and th that's where many people believe that Herod, when he arrested John, put him in prison at Machaerus. And that would be close to Jerusalem and Judea where Jesus was. And there may have been good reason for him to get out of Dodge and to say, okay, it's time to go up north to Galilee and mm -hmm. continue my ministry there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it may or may not be what was in his mind. I don't know. Um, but it just kind of helps associate what we've been reading about and talking about with, mm -hmm. with what's on deck here. Yeah. So. And, and if that's the case, if Jesus was trying to get away from Herod Antipas, um, Herod Antipas was in charge of Galilee and in of Perea, but he was not in charge of Galen Galenitis where Bethesda, Beth Beth Bethsaida was. Um, so it's very possibility that Jesus for a while 
was just outside of Herod's jurisdiction so that he could choose his disciples and they could start their ministry. Well, uh, just a, 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 as far as current first Corinthians is concerned, just a minute on that. I think um, mm -hmm. what Paul is urging here very clearly is that this is not a new law for him. That if you're married, you got to uh, put away your wife. He's saying times are coming that are going to be very challenging. And so if you've got family obligations, look out because it's going to become very fearful and very complicated. And so throughout this whole thing, there's a wonderful evangelical attitude that says, you don't have to do this. But what I'm telling you is don't take on something new right now uh, because uh, the times are going to get very severe. And of course they did for mm -hmm. all of the apostles uh, and those especially that, that had families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that leads me, that, that lends um, currency, if, if that's the right expression, to my idea that Jesus let these guys understand what was coming. Um, obviously, John's arrested. I'm asking you to follow me now professionally, I guess. Know that bad things could happen. So I'm, I'm asking you to come, and they wanted to. It was their choice, um, an informed decision. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other yeah. comments or do we i think it might be time to wrap it up i don't want people to not watch us because we're too long um on that note i thank you for watching um and i uh thank you for sharing i wish that you um i, I wish you god's blessings as we all study together his word come to an understanding so that we know what to share with the world because the world needs God, needs God's love at this time more than any other. Um, we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you. So long.